Good afternoon and welcome to today's WISE webinar. My name is Jamie Pendergrafts and I'm the Communications and Outreach Director for the Ticket to Work program. We do have one quick note today for those of you who need captions. We have a new link if you would like to view captions in your web browser and you can find it by going to number five in the web links pod, which is at the bottom right hand of your screen. And again, you can view links in the webinar itself, but you can also take a look at it in a browser if you would prefer that. And we'll discuss that a little more later. Thank you for joining us today as we start this month's webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Pat Van Nelson. Pat is the Deputy Director of the Ticket Program Manager and has over 30 years of related experience to, br br to bring to today's topic and discussion. Pat, over to you. Well, thanks, Jamie. Good afternoon, everyone, and <clears throat> welcome to the Ticket to Work webinar. It's called Managing Stress During Your Job Search and Beyond. As Jamie said, my name is Pat Van Nelson, and I'm a member of the Ticket to Work team, and I'll be a moderator today. On behalf of Social Security and the entire Ticket team, thank you for joining us to learn about the program and the many types of service providers that you can call on to help you as you find your way to financial independence through work. Many of you probably know that the president designated last month, May, as Mental Health Awareness Month to recognize that our mental health affects every part of our lives. But it's not just one month a year. Our mental health determines how we think, how we feel, and how we act. And that includes how we handle stress. Today, we're going to talk about one potential source of stress, work and looking for work. I can tell you from my own experience that I get really anxious before a job interview. And for me, the best way to relax is to do so much preparation that I'm ready for any questions that might come my way. But that's what works for me. Today, we'll provide some other ideas that might work for you when you experience your own kind of stress. I think I probably say every month in these webinars, but it doesn't make it any less true, that I think one of the best things about the ticket program is that it recognizes that we're each unique and every one of us creates our own path. So today, our goal and our hope is that we can provide you with information that will help you create yours. So let's get started. We want you to get the most out of today's presentation, so we've got a few tips for using this webinar platform. First, there's the audio. You can manage your audio using the audio option at the top of your screen. The audio option is an icon that looks like a speaker. When you click on it, there's a drop-down menu. Choose Select Speaker from the menu options, as you can see on the screen now. Just a reminder, everyone attending will be muted, except for me and, of course, our speaker. When it asks you how you want to join the meeting for the audio, pick Device Speaker if you want the sound to come through your computer. Be sure to turn on your speakers or plug in your headset. If you'd rather listen by phone, you can dial 1-800-832-0736 and enter an access code. That's 4189148 and then the pound sign. You can also join the meeting audio to receive a phone call, as you'll see in the image on the screen, and enter that same number and access code. All right. Now let's move to cover some information about our webinar's accessibility. On the Adobe Connect platform, you'll notice different boxes on your screen. Those boxes are called pods. We have the presentation pod, and this is where the slide deck appears. That's the largest portion of the screen. Below that's an open space for the placement of closed captioning. The top right corner is the Q&A pod, and below that's the web links pod. I think Jamie mentioned that earlier. We'll talk about these pods in more detail in just a little bit. But first, we want to talk about accessibility. If you happen to need assistance navigating this Adobe Connect platform, 
an accessibility user guide that has a list of controls is available on the website at http colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly slash adobe hyphen accessibility. A link to the Adobe Accessibility User Guide is also available in the web link spot at the bottom right of your screen. It's called Adobe Accessibility User Guide. So if you want to use that one, you can go to the web link spot and access that now. Real-time captioning is available and active and is displayed in the captioning pod below the slides. You can show or hide the captioning display and you can also choose the text size and text color combinations to best meet your vision preferences. Open closed captioning by selecting the CC option from the top menu bar. The captioning link can also be accessed in the web links pod under the title web captioning. I believe it's number five. You can also access captioning online in a separate viewing window. Choice is up to you and your viewing preference. If you're fluent in American Sign Language and you'd like support during today's webinar, just follow the link that provides instructions on how to connect with an interpreter through the Federal Communications Commission's Video Relay Service. The ASL User Guide is available in the web links pod under the title ASL User Guide. We're going to be pausing for questions at two different points throughout the webinar. So please send your questions to us at any time during the webinar. Just type them into the Q&A pod. I'll direct questions to our speaker during the Q&A portions of the webinar. I'm going to do my best to get to as many as possible. If you're listening by phone and you're not logged into the webinar platform, you can ask your questions by sending us an email to webinars at choosework.ssa.gov. Another useful item is this web links pod that I've been mentioning. It has the links for the resources that we'll cover today. Just select the ones that interest you to learn more. If you're listening by phone, you can email webinars at choosework.ssa.gov for a list of these resources. You can also look at the confirmation email that you got for today's webinar to access the resources. Just a reminder, Social Security cannot guarantee and isn't responsible for the accessibility of external websites. We're recording today's webinar, so if you miss something and you want to go back and listen again, we'll be posting it within two weeks on the Choose Work website at https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash wise underscore on demand. This link is also in the web links pod titled Wise Webinar Archives. Mm -hmm. We hope you have a good experience during the web webinar today and your technology will cooperate with you. However, if you do run into technical difficulties, you can use the Q&A pod to send us a message or you can email us at webinars at choosework.ssa.gov and our team will help you. In a minute, you'll hear from my colleague and today's speaker, Derek Shields. Derek's no stranger to the intersection of disability and work. He spent the past 28 years in the areas of disability inclusion, employment, and accessibility. He has a master's degree in management and disability services from the University of San Francisco. And in addition to his contributions to the ticket program, he's also president of Forward Works Consulting and a co-founder and board advisor of the National Disability Mentoring Coalition. Importantly for today, Derek also spends a good portion of his training time focused on mental health and mental wellness. During today's webinar, Derek's going to cover the Ticket to Work program, the many service providers that are available to you, and provide those strategies I mentioned earlier about different ways to handle stress, whether it's on the job or on the job search. I hope what you take away from this session is a better understanding of the Ticket to Work program, who's eligible, and how to use your ticket. We'll introduce the different types of service providers and provide you with tips you can use when you find yourself feeling stressed. I'll be back with you during the question and answer session, so remember to put your questions in that Q&A pod. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce and turn over to the microphone, Derek Fields. Pat, thank you so much for setting us up so nicely today and uh, remembering May as Mental Health Awareness Month here in the United States. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone again this month to talk about a very important topic and it's managing stress when seeking work or transitioning into work and working. Um, one of the ways that we start out our webinars is, if you've been with us before you know this, is we cover um, the ticket program and we cover our service providers as part of your employment team. And, you know, really today we're doing that with this idea in mind that having this information is another tool in your toolkit to help manage stress. Um, so with this in mind, I'm going to cover those areas first. As Pat mentioned, we'll take a break to answer your questions there, so please submit those. And then we'll come back to, for the real core of the content on managing stress. And we have some good information and tips available for you today. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, you know, it's really important to begin by covering the two Social Security dif Disability Benefit programs. Um, if you're not familiar with them, then we need to become familiar with them in order to know, you know, if you qualify for the ticket program. And from there, we can explore using the members of the employment team. So let's cover them. We have Social Security Disability Insurance, also known as SSDI. And note that that is a disability insurance program. And it's a program that people have paid into while working. So if you have worked in the past and you maybe have had FICA taxes withheld from your paycheck, you're actually contributing to a fund for disability insurance benefits that if you require it later, you're able to tap into. And it gets adjusted, matters on how long you've worked and how much you've earned, and there is a maximum amount. And that can be important to note that everybody's benefit is going to be different when we talk about the Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, you do need a, a kind of a longer history too, sometimes up to 10 years to become insured. And, you know, that really varies, but recall that's insurance. And when you have worked in the past, you've paid in the program. And with SSDI, we don't really care about really your resources. We're not looking at unearned income that you may have. It's about the insurance program and what you've put into it. Now, on the contrast, the second one listed here, Supplemental Security Income, we call that SSI. And notice this one doesn't say insurance. And this is a needs-based program provided by Social Security to people who have not worked enough to be insured for SSDI or who don't have any work history at all. And perhaps that's because of a disability. So it's very, very different. It's also going to look to see if you have a low amount of resources and low income amounts. And remember, the insurance program doesn't do that. So Social Security also administers the SSI program and pays monthly benefits to people with limited income and resources who are blind or have a qualifying disability. You should know it's also available for people who are 65 or older and children with disabilities or those children who are blind, they can also access SSI. So these are the two Social Security Disability Benefits programs. And it's really important to know, you know, if you're participating, you know, what do I have? Um, and if you're not sure, here we have a way for you to, to find out. You could sign up for a My Social Security account or a My SSA account. These accounts have to be set up at the Social Security website, and they're going to ask you for some personal information. Now, this is something that I've done and many people have done. It's safe and secure, and when you sign up, this is where you're going to be able to check out information about your work history. It's going to tell you if you're eligible for Social Security Disability Insurance and how much you would receive if you paid into it. And it's also going to be able to tell you if you have family members, how much those family members would receive as dependents. So there's a lot of information in there. I look at mine now and then. 
and you know when you log into it you can read the social security statement some of you maybe used to get it in the mail this is a place to look at it online and you can check out your eligibility for benefits status for the SSI side it will also clarify that you have benefits that are SSI and how much those benefits are and all of that information is going to be very helpful to have with you when you start to talk to members of your employment team. So if you don't have a My SSA account, we recommend that you get one because this is something, it's going to give you the information you need in those first conversations and it'll make your stress reduced a little bit by being informed. So you can go to ssa.gov forward slash my account. There's a lot of great information in there that you can explore and we recommend you check that out. Okay, next we want to begin with this idea if we have SSDI or SSI benefits and you know, we want to talk about starting your journey and we are all here. Your entire employment team is here to help guide the process by giving you the information and the projections that will uh, help you with starting your journey. But it's really important to know that this is your choice. While we want you to explore it, the choice is yours. And in doing that, we want you to consider the idea of choosing work. You know, so why choose work? Um, when we look at work and we think about it, um, you know, work can help. It can help in recovery. Um, it can help in actually a, a strategy for not just creating stress, but for giving structure to handle stress as well. But work works and it's kind of straightforward in that regard. Um, it gets people out of poverty and it gives people the ability to to make a choice. So make choices for yourself about the things you want to do and perhaps earning some excess money that you could save up and experience things to support fulfilling your dreams. Now, when we think about earning a living through employment, it's not something that everybody can do. We understand that. And it's why the benefits exist. And the disability standard is very tough. But if work is the right choice for you and you want to try it for the first time or explore it, um, it's important that you understand the many free services and supports that are available to you. Um, and you can find that the rewards for working will outweigh the risks. And we're going to explore that today uh, and talk specifically about how uh, the process of getting work can help you um, actually uh, come out on the other side and potentially have uh, less stress in life. One of the ways that we offer that is through the Ticket to Work program. This is a free and voluntary social security program that offers career development services and support for people's, that people that are ages 18 through 64 who receive social security disability benefits and, of course, want to work. So notice that voluntary is bolded. This is that point about this choice is yours. You don't have to participate. Uh, and you know when you think about this, um, once you decide that you want to explore this, the only commitment that we're looking for is a commitment to have employment goals. And the destination is full-time employment. And that this would increase your ability to have the things you want and would allow you to um, access um, new opportunities. So the Ticket to Work program is available to you and those free employment services that I was mentioning come specifically uh, with certain areas that maybe match up with what you're looking for. Um, so first, you know, deciding if work is right for you. You join this session today to explore managing stress during the job search process or perhaps starting work or at, at work. And um, we want to talk a little bit about, well, if that's the right option, how could we also limit the amount of stress as you make that decision for work? Um, how about preparing for work? You know, somebody might need some educational preparation. 
like uh, perhaps you um, have a disability and you're going to try a new career but you need some education or training in advance in order to qualify well the ticket program is designed to assist with that and then once you do have the qualifications of course receiving help in finding a job which can be challenging well we have our ticket to work employment networks available and we'll talk about them in, in a little bit that have experts that are really good at that they have relationships with employers they can help you connect with employers and prepare for those interviews um, which could be as Pat mentioned preparation could reduce stress but it's not going to eliminate it but we have some of the employment team that's here to help with that and then that last one there how about succeeding at work you know this is a very important part um, it, it's important that you know after we decide to work and we have the training and education and we go after the job we want that we can experience success and that could be in a task or in a day with a project um, or it could be over a longer period of time where you're contributing to a mission at the organization you're with but that success will allow you to have fulfillment and that fulfillment can reduce stress and of course it could increase your independence and your self-sufficiency uh, through the earnings you have and the um, quality feelings you have from contributing to that mission so these are great things these services that come as free employment services through the ticket to work program and we want you to be aware of those when you think of uh, the ticket program and you think of questions like well am I on SSDI or SSI I don't have a my SSA account or I'm not sure about you know, where should I start with all of this information what we want you to do is to reach out to the ticket to work helpline there's a lot of different points of entry we're going to mention this a few times but it's important for you to know about this toll-free helpline that's there to support you on your journey to financial independence and to know that the beneficiary support specialists are trained to help you and answer your questions and are indeed part of your team so you can reach out to the helpline Monday through Friday 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time and we have two lines the telephone line is 1-866-968-7842 or if you're a TTY user you can contact 1-866-833-2967 again we encourage you to reach out to the Ticket to Work helpline for beneficiary support services they can help answer your personal questions so today when we take questions you know we're, we can only answer more of your general questions during the session but if you have a, a very specific question about your benefits and about your situation and trying to obtain employment or transition um, to self-sufficiency please know that the helpline specialists are prepared to assist okay that's the end of our first section on the benefit programs and on the ticket program and now I'm going to turn to your employment team and working with the ticket to work service providers and these are the individuals that as you design your own team are going to be able to increase your confidence in what steps to do in what order and putting that plan in place that will allow you to have the structure that maybe will be able to help you kind of uh, organize a very uh, complicated process and in doing so help reduce your stress by just partnering with these employment team members so what we have here in this first part is just a quick overview of all the members of the employment team so the ticket program service providers include these organizations employment networks we call them ENs there's also workforce employment networks and then we have our state vocational rehabilitation agencies you might hear those referred to as the VR agencies or VR programs we also have the work incentives planning and assistance projects or the WIPAs and then the last part of the the provider team 
protection and advocacy for beneficiaries of social security organizations. We call those the PABs. So now I'm going to review each one of these so you can become more familiar with um, kind of what their mission is, what their scope is, and potentially find ways where you would be able to access services. So first, what is an EN? What's this employment network that you've been hearing about? An employment network is a private or public organization that has an agreement with Social Security to provide free employment support services to people who are eligible for the ticket program. So this does include those workforce ENs and many of those are American job centers. They could also be other workforce system entities. So we do have employment networks that serve every part of the country and some of them can limit themselves to like a certain geography, maybe a city or a town. Some of them are more regional. They cover a metropolitan area or perhaps a, a zone of the country. And then we have others that are national and you could reach out to them remotely and they could support you. So it's really your choice. You know, if you're living in Maryland and you are okay with a provider in Denver providing the employment support services, that choice is yours. If you want somebody who's in your backyard, then you could reach out and meet with somebody in person. So it's really flexible in that regard. Um, th these services, again, are for disabled adults ages 18 through 64 and you have to be participating in the ticket program but the ENs are available and we will now cover some of the um, other services that we have that are available. On this slide I just mentioned the flexibility of geography and whether you can go in person or virtually um, but what I wanted to get into more was how ENs can help you because if the idea of going to work generate stress or the idea of finding work generates stress then working with an EN could help give you that plan so it's important to look at the services and supports they offer that are designed to help you on this pathway to financial independence specifically they can help identify your employment and work goals and that could be a job it could be a career but what we're looking at is a pathway to full-time employment and them walking you through with some questions to help you kind of identify what those are and get those written down. And then once you have those goals in place, they can help create or perhaps update your resume. You know, resumes and online applications are really important still. And being able to transfer your strengths and skills along with your experiences to best position you in a competitive marketplace is something that the ENs are really good at. So if that's an area that you're a little nervous about, you could tap into them for that service. Next, the preparation for interviews. You know, that, Pat mentioned it, but that makes us all nervous when we prepare to interview. If we want a job and we know that we're being compared to other candidates, then being able to practice with an employment network in order to prepare um, and perhaps do a little role play uh, in advance of that interview. These are the types of questions you may get asked. And if you do get asked this, you know, here are some extra tips for you to think about uh, before that interview so you could be prepared and more confident. ENs can also assist with if you're going to identify your disability and disclose that with how to request a reasonable accommodation either as a candidate or after you do have the position and you onboard um, and um, you can receive benefits counseling some employment networks do have uh, qualified benefits counselors and you could receive kind of two types of services from that employment network so lots of good services and supports coming from the employment networks as part of your employment team. All right. Next, let's turn to the State Vocational Rehabilitation Agency. Uh, the state VR agencies, as I mentioned, they provide a lot of services and as a ticket to work service provider can help you return to work 
and they can help you think about perhaps a new career track. Let's say you started out down one path earlier in life and now you're thinking about new employment goals. Um, they're able to, through vocational rehabilitation and training and education, kind of help reposition you to be competitive and be qualified for that new track. In some states, it's important to note that there are separate vocational rehabilitation agencies. So you could have a VR agency that serves individuals who are blind and visually impaired and another agency that serves all other people with disabilities that qualify for state VR agencies. So a lot of good services coming out of state VR as one of your team members. Um, the other thing I'll note is they can also offer benefits counseling. Um, so, you know, if you're working with your state VR agency and you have questions, it's good to inquire if they have that available to you as well for planning on the transition, you know, how will work impact my benefits. Speaking of benefits counseling, our next member of the employment team is up here, the WIPAs, the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Projects. The WIPA projects are across the country and they're staffed by individuals that we call Community Work Incentives co Coordinators. And these individuals, the, the CWICs or these coordinators provide free benefits counseling to eligible Social Security disability beneficiaries about how work and earnings will affect your SSDI, SSI, Medicare or Medicaid, and all other public benefits. So we often hear the question, how will work impact my health care benefits? This free benefits counseling will be able to walk you through you know, the details of that for your specific situation. Um, and also understanding out of the Social Security work incentives, you know, which ones might be available to you and then how you might apply for those. Now there's a lot of them, there's over 20 of them. So having a benefits counselor look at the ones for, that are appropriate for SSDI or SSI beneficiaries will help reduce the stress that's involved for you there. Um, they can also explain the you know, benefits of employment and importantly, help dispel these myths that we hear that you know, trying work or going to work is going to have a detrimental impact for you. It's not going to be a benefit. They'll walk you through about how long you could keep your health care. And in some cases, this is over nine years. And then you have this opportunity to, you know, increase your income um, over that nine year period of time, gain benefits from an employer, and then, you know, find that financial self-sufficiency that's part of your life plan. So in this regard, you can reach out to the WIPAs and access services around the work incentives. And on this slide, we talk about how the work incentives can make it possible for you to work while still keeping those benefits. And that includes Medicare and Medicaid. Also having access to those individualized services and supports, which are so important, and keeping some or all of those benefit payments as you transition to work. So all three very important areas that benefits planners can assist you with as you're navigating uh, your transition to looking for work, applying, and then potentially starting work. Um, on this slide, we do talk about who the WIPA projects serve. And this is important. You can reach out to the Ticket to Work helpline to refer you to a WIPA project. So if you're receiving SSDI, you have SSDI related Medicare, or you have SSI or SSI related Medicaid, then you could reach out to the Ticket to Work helpline. They'll refer you to the appropriate uh, work incentives um, agency. And if you're eligible, they'll be able to provide services. Right now, we're looking at people that are eligible for WIPA services who are currently working or self-employed have a job offer pending or are actively interviewing for jobs. And of course, today we're going to talk about the stress during kind of the search process and the interviewing process. 
Um, so if you, if you are interviewing for a job, technically that means that you had an interview in the past 30 days or you have one scheduled in the next two weeks. So that, that's your eligibility. If you are a younger person or if you're a family member or an ally for a younger person age 14 to 25, who's even in the earliest stages of considering work, those individuals are also eligible for WIPA services as more of a youth transition focus as well. So please keep those eligibility rules in mind. Once you start interviewing for, for jobs, you can tap those services to get the guidance you need on how to transition and keep your benefits and participate with the work incentives. Okay, the last member of the team that we talk about, this employment team, we call this the legal wing the PABs, the Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security. And these are organizations that provide free legal assistance to people who receive Social Security disability benefits and who have disability related employment issues. So the PABs focus on really these three areas, legal support, advocacy, and information to help beneficiaries resolve employment related concerns with employers with Social Security and with other members of this employment team, like an employment related concern with an EN or a VR or a WIPA or other entities. So PABs as the legal wing are really positioned to help you in these three areas, navigating organizations and services to support your effort to work and protect your rights. An example of that could be something like appealing a decision of a vocational rehabilitation agency or an employment network. If you feel that your rights from the VR agency or the N have been impacted inappropriately, then you can talk to a PABS and they would be able to work through an appeal of the decision. Next, if a PABS can help with requesting reasonable accommodations, and these can happen in a lot of places, if you're requesting an accommodation in a college class or a training course, you know, or, you know, a licensing program, trying to improve your skills and your assets inventory, you know, your strengths that would help qualify you for a position and it's denied, you can reach out to the PABs and they're going to be able to assist with that request process. Again, it's, you know, maybe they could help reword it and make sure that it shows how the reasonable accommodation would allow you to more effectively participate in a full and equal access compared to a non-disabled peer. And the last part there, if you do go into the workplace as a candidate or a new employee and you're having a challenge with the request of the reasonable accommodation, the PABs can help. The third example is addressing other disability-based legal issues that are barriers to employment. Um, and this can include transportation. So when we think of barriers to employment, sometimes folks have a more narrow view of what that means, but the PABs can help out with a lot of things, including, you know, if you need to access transportation, um, they're going to be there to help you. Um, they are the legal service providers. They're helping people who receive SSI and SSDI uh, and have a disability related employment issue. They're available in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, in five territories, and on a few reservations in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And they're free to everyone receiving Social Security disability benefits. So the PABs wrap up the employment team. Now that we've covered the benefit programs and the Ticket to Work program and the, the service providers in your Ticket to Work employment team, you know, we'll shift gears and start thinking about the path to success. Um, and, you know, as Pat mentioned in her opening remarks, everyone's path is different. Um, you know, we find financial independence through work in different ways. Just as many as there's many jobs and careers, there's different ways of finding them. And once you decide to pursue employment, these service providers will help you with three significant offerings. Creating a plan that will define your goals with you, capture them, and then set up a timeline 
what are we going to do first, what's going to happen in the middle, and then when we get to success, what will we do then at the end? They're going to help you understand your responsibility for work, reporting work and earnings. So as we get to success, how do we maintain that? So we're reporting and um, using the process successfully. And in the end, following your plan, which will lead you to achieve your employment goals. Having that plan is really important to managing stress. And having the right service provider is an important step in the process. And if you're ready to find a service provider to either begin or restart your employment journey, we recommend visiting the Find Help page on our website. And at that page, you can go to Find Help, and you can search by your zip code or by the services that are offered. If you're interested in somebody with experience with your specific disability, you can check that out. You can also look at languages spoken, or if you know that you really want to work with a specific provider, like an employment network or a state VR agency, you could select that too. The Find Help page is a good option. You can find um, how to access that under the web links pod at number nine. If the internet and the Find Help tool isn't for you, again, please contact the Ticket to Work helpline. You can ask for a list of service providers and the beneficiary support specialist will generate that list based on what you're seeking. Call them at 1-866-968-7842 or through TTY at 1-866-833-2967. Those specialists are available again Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay, Pat, we made it through the first couple of sections. It's time for our, our first question break. And we have some. So, Derek, if one person wants to know if they need to use the ticket program to find work, what if they find job by themselves? Can they just apply for it? So it's a good question. If you find a job posting that you think is a good fit, you can apply for it without using the ticket program. The key here is really before you begin working or as you begin working, it's important to update Social Security about your employment status. And remember, you become eligible once you start interviewing or once you start working, you become eligible to talk to the WIPAs, the benefits counselors, about how earnings will impact your work uh, and, uh, sorry, impact your benefits. So you don't have to use the ticket program, but we really recommend talking to the benefits counselors and then updating Social Security about your employment status and potentially any earnings. So that would be the, the recommendation that we have. If you're not sure how to do that, best point of entry is calling the, the helpline, the beneficiary support helpline. We've given that number out a couple times and we'll do it again. We'll do it again before we wrap up. Thanks, Derek. How about someone who's never had a job? Can the ticket program help them? Absolutely. I think sometimes people feel like, you know, I, I haven't worked and I don't know if this is for me because these people are, you know, helping folks return to work who've acquired disabilities. That's not the case. The program is designed for folks who haven't worked before. And remember, there's a lot of training and education services. You may find that, you know, vocational rehabilitation comes first and you access the ticket program through the VR agency, get the training and voc rehab services and then you're going to have the qualifications to perhaps go into the field of your choice. Other folks who haven't worked could work with the employment network, find out that, well, maybe an apprenticeship is one of the ways for you to begin your career. We call it earn while you learn, or maybe it's learn while you earn. <laughs> it's one of them. Um, but apprenticeships are all across the country right now, and it's a great way for somebody who hasn't um, accumulated uh, work experience to, in effect, have, um, you know, a, a mentor who trains them in a skill. And then at the end of that, you not only have full-time employment, but you've gone from not working into a career. Oh, 
Well, that, Derek, that brings me to the next question. It was a nice tie-in. It says, I'm working with a VR now. Can I work with an EN too? Yeah, you know, Pat, that's, it's one we hear, it's called different things in different places, but I get that question a fair amount. And the answer is yes, but not at the same time. So your employment team, it's really designed to support you at different experiences. So if you're working with your VR agency and you're going, let's say you want to go after an associate's degree to get new, new skills and a degree that allows you to qualify for really the job that you're looking for. Well, you could do that through the VR agency. Once you achieve that and you apply and you get the job, then the VR agency would do what they call, you know, close the case. Then you could transfer your ticket over to an employment network for the ongoing job supports. Things like, you know, I, I don't know, the game of work is new to you. They can help you understand how to communicate with a supervisor. They can make sure that you're doing the things like, you know, the timesheets and uh, reporting your earnings to Social Security correctly, all the supports that you need. So they, we call that Partnership Plus. So it's working with VR and then kind of the consecutive following services through the EN. But for those of you that are out there that are working with VR now, you know, think about when you're done working with them, finding an employment network for those ongoing supports. These are the things, if we have them around us, that are, are scaffolding and they help us in transitions. And importantly for our theme today, maybe reduce some of the stress that's involved in those transitions. Thanks, Derek. Uh, I think we probably need to move on to the next part of your presentation. But I do want to remind folks that we'll have another Q&A session in a little bit. So please keep those questions coming. Excellent. Thanks, Pat. Well, I appreciate everyone listening to the ticket program overview and the service providers. It's important that we cover that. Um, now we're really going to enter the, the core of our content and focus on managing stress during a job search and while on the job too. Um, and, you know, this is you know, many of you probably came to explore this with us today, and I appreciate your interest. Let's start out by talking a little bit about kind of what is mental health and what is stress. And then we'll get into some tips and exploring some other resources. Mental health includes emotional, psychological, and social well-being, and it affects how we think, feel, and act. This is quite broad but it's really our, our fundamental baseline for thinking about stress today. Uh, mental health also helps us determine how we're gonna handle the stress, how we're gonna relate to others, and how we're gonna make choices. These choices can include, of course, our choice to seek work and our choice to apply and to work. Um, mental health, we all have it. And when we think about physical health, you know, there's a notion in our country that all of us, you know, have to work out on, with our physical health. And um, what we like to do is also think about, well, what do we do to support our mental health, to include our emotional, psychological, and social well-being? Because in doing so, it's going to help us in how we handle stress. So in thinking about how what stress is and how we handle it, you know, we recognize that stress affects us all and it can affect our moods and increase our symptoms, especially if we have some mental health conditions or mental illness. So as we explore this, we keep in mind mental illnesses such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress. And I just want to take a minute and talk about these because they're really important. Um, you know, we all have levels of anxiety so when we think of anxiety, we could all identify at some level with that. It's fairly natural, in fact, to have anxiety. There are people, though, that are living with anxiety disorders, and that differs from normal stress or normal anxiety. Anxiety disorders are really characterized by this notion of an excessive fear or worry, and this could create some disturbance in behavior. And these symptoms become so severe um, that they, you know, 
drive a significant distress or some interruption in our functioning. Um, and that can interrupt things like relationships and work. So anxiety disorder and stress will impact job search and will impact, of course, work itself. Next, we have depression. Depression is different than normal mood fluctuations. So, you know, if you, some of us can have mood changes or short-lived kind of emotional responses. Um, well, those are challenges that arrive in everyday life, just like regular anxiety, it's not a, a disorder. And just like regular emotional responses, that's not depression. During a depressive episode, the person experiences a, a, a depressed mood. This is sadness, irritability, loneliness, or emptiness. And there's just a, a disconnection from pleasure or an interest in activities. And depression can rise, if it stays there for a significant period of time, to impact many things. Again, work and relationships being two of those. And our last example here is post-traumatic stress. And this is a mental health condition that's triggered by a, an event that is received as terrifying. This could be either terrifying in direct experience or in witnessing. And the symptoms can include things like flashbacks or nightmares um, and severe anxiety. So some of these start to become interconnected in this regard. Really the importance of knowing these definitions is, you know, if you're living with one of these, we're going to talk about some resources for you. Um, but it's about the stress and knowing the potential signs of stress. So with these, we see things like sleeplessness, sleeplessness and lack of the ability to focus. And that managing stress can definitely impact uh, and reduce the negative effects. And remember how I said earlier, how our mental health also helps determine how we handle stress, how we relate to others through relationship, and how we make our choices. One of those choices we can make is about work. So let's talk about work and specifically managing stress. I think it's important to think of work as being more than a job. And that's hard because, you know, you hear, well, what do you do? And that's all about, well, my job is. And you hear that a lot when you meet people. Um, but work is more than a job, and it can give you a real sense of purpose. And there's a couple of different ways we can explore that. The first one is setting and accomplishing a goal. So with work, we can have the purpose, and we can feel the sense of accomplishment. So in setting and accomplishing a goal, you can think about it. Let's make a list, and on that, that's, you know, what this is all about. You know, I did this this morning when I got up. I took a pad out, because I'm old school and still use paper, and I wrote a list of the things I had to accomplish today. I wanted to think about this training session and talking to you all, so I had to make sure my talking points were together and I was prepared. I had other things I needed to do, um, and, you know, so I did that. I start out each week making a, a plan for the week, and then I start out each day really zeroing in on that day. Um, what are the tasks? What are the activities? And then, you know what feels great? When I accomplish it. Maybe some of you feel this way. When you can cross something off that you've done. Well, I committed to do that. I wanted to make two applications this week. I went and I wrote it on the piece of paper. Once I made those two applications, I crossed it off. Well, now I'm through that goal for this week and I sense, you know, accomplishment. And then you could think about that, you know, whether it's earning a promotion or developing new skills, set those goals, create the lists, and then you could feel that sense of accomplishment. So there's a sense of purpose in that, whether it's you know, in work or in the job search itself, or it could be in other tasks like preparing for work and getting those training and educations in place. The other one here is investing in yourself and your future. Now, working is a way to do that, of course, and that's going to be while earning more income and gaining your independence or on your path to financial self-sufficiency. 
And that sense of accomplishment you can gain from work is helpful for individuals, I believe, that benefit from structure. If you're in recovery and structure helps, then work can be part of recovery. And if you're also somebody that does well as in a team, then having the commitment to others will give you a structure that I don't want to let my team down. I'm going to show up and deliver my activities. Well, that could help me with a sense of accomplishment as well. So work can give us all purpose and we can set and achieve goals and invest in ourselves through jobs or through careers. Definitely more than the idea of just a job, but it becomes a connection between what my career interest is, the organizations I want to work with, and the impact I can have through that organizational mission. With this in mind, now we actually get to the core tips for managing stress. And we hope that you can take something away from these tips today and the strategies that we'll cover um, along with these four. So when we start out, if you're working or looking for work, we have some specific strategies. And the first one is to make your plan. I mentioned to-do lists. And really, when we think about our personal strategic plan, if that's an employment plan, it's breaking up tasks and creating those lists. And that process will help you become less overwhelmed. You write it down, and then you do the activities, and you break them down into priorities with timelines. So we talked about that one. The next one's really important and sometimes we don't do this so well, but taking care of ourselves. This is around nutrition. Are we eating as well as possible? Are we taking any of the medication that perhaps our doctors have prescribed? And are we getting the sleep that we need to really help us feel the best? There's other things that we know can help too. Um, are we getting sufficient um, exercise? And that can mean different things for different people. Are we going for a walk? Are we doing some chair stretching? Uh, and when possible, it's important to, if you can, be in the sun to get some sunlight. These are the things that we know help us feel better. Um, so we need to be making time for that. And the third strategy is to ask for help. So make a plan, take care of yourself, and ask for help. We know that things aren't always going to go the way that the plan was written up. For most of us, we never intended to be where we are right now, but we kept on planning and we kept on talking to other people, asking for their feedback and assistance. And this is where you can adapt. And I think sometimes it's a family member, sometimes it's a close friend or colleague. And in this case, you also, if you're eligible to participate with the ticket program service providers, can look at your employment team for help as well. So we have these three strategies, make a plan, take care of yourself, and ask for help. I'd ask you to think about, well, how am I doing with those three? If I rate myself, is there one that I could do a little bit better on? For me, I know that taking care of myself is an area that I struggle in. I need more sleep and my nutrition could improve. So, you know, I need to evaluate myself and then go back and improve there because by doing that, I will help manage my stress. When we think about managing stress more specifically on the job, here we have a list of 10 steps that will help you stay on track while on the job search or potentially as we are working as well. First, it's a good idea when you're doing a job search. You know, we have the plan, we're taking care of ourselves and we're asking for help. Um, now we're, maybe we're, we're, we're at our house and we're trying to figure out how are we gonna start? We really recommend first creating a, a space. This space is dedicated. It has your most important materials. Maybe there's some folders and papers that you've collected that have your, your tasks and activities written down. Maybe you have your computer there so you could do your research. But this is a place that you go to during your job search that's dedicated. And in this regard, 
you know, you might not need a large space, but when you're there, you're doing your job search work, and when you're done, you're able to leave that. Job searching can become like a full-time job. So when you want to take care of yourself, you need to give yourself a break, and so being able to leave that dedicated space will allow you to kind of, um, yes, I worked in a space free of clutter, but I can also, you know, leave that to uh, refresh my mind. So that's number one. Number two, it's really important to identify your career goals. If we begin with the end in mind, like I have work ahead to do in my job search, but I know that I have these skills and I know that I want to work in this field. I have good organizational skills. I'm pretty good at analyzing numbers. I would like to be an analysis on a project team because I like working with others. Well, that's the end goal. I want to have the title it has this word analysis in it because I like doing that and coming up with recommendations based on analysis work. So that's my end goal and knowing that will help you organize things as you move forward. And if you think about it, it's your draft. If you're going to work with an employment team, they're going to ask you at that employment network, well, what are your employment goals? You've had a good draft of those that will help you in talking to them and it will make that experience a little bit less stressful because you've worked through this. So you could use that dedicated workspace and write down some draft goals. Uh, that would help you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm helping manage my stress. I know some people that post those goals up next to that workstation and they're looking at them. Some people put it on the mirror, maybe in the bathroom, so they see it each day and it makes them think about, well, I'm working towards that and everything I do will help me get there. That will help manage some stress. With that goal, we have the schedule. Number three, it's really important. I've mentioned it several times. Um, if, if organizational you know, skills aren't your thing, we really need to make sure that you have a schedule in place. So I have my goal. What am I going to break down in each week, in each month, that I'm going to try to achieve? So I will be moving forward. You know, do I have to update my resume? Am I going to be spending time researching job openings? Are you doing some research on keywords to include in applications? There's a lot of things that you could be doing, but we can't do them all at once. So we recommend chunking that out, writing it down in a schedule. On this day, at this time, I'm going to, I'm going to do these activities. And this will help you achieve short-term um, successes. And those short-term successes will lead into longer-term ones on your way to that ultimate goal, and that's that job or career of your choosing. Number four, setting daily goals. You know, I've talked about activities at the hourly level or daily. Um, you know, I really think about the importance of, you know, like something like today, I'm going to spend three hours doing job search tasks, but I also got to do some personal things. I have laundry to do. I'm going to return some books to the library. Um, I promised my sister I'd take her to her appointment. Well, that's a pretty good day right there. You're committed three hours to job search activities, and you're also doing these three other important tasks. You know, if we, if we each get up each day and we accomplish four significant things, and we could check them off at night, then we're going to feel like I set up for myself up with a good plan, I delivered, and now I can feel like, well, tomorrow I'm going to build upon that. So having daily goals is a really important strategy as well, and you'll feel that sense of accomplishment. Number five gets a little bit more into alignment with goals. So this, in, in research, like the, the research I spoke of before. So if I'm interested, let's say, in a non-office job, and I'm not exactly sure, but I'm looking for something in trade, maybe down a path for construction, but I like to work with my hands. I could be a mechanic, but I don't really have the background there. Well, I need to develop a list of companies that I need to know if they're hiring. So I need to spend some time researching these organizations that align with my non-office job interests. When I discover 
that I don't know much about this, but well, for non-office jobs, I could go to apprenticeship.gov. And since if I'm going to be a mechanic, I don't have that background, I would need to be taught and learn under the supervision of a more experienced person, then I could use the zip code tool there and find mechanic apprenticeship opportunities that are in the region that I can get to, perhaps through public transportation or through my own vehicle. The, the key here is aligning the listing in, the, of the, in your research time with your broader goal. What I've experienced is a lot of people do a lot of research, but it's not aligned with the employment goal. And with so many job openings, you can go in so many different directions. Then I hear people almost create their own stress because they're applying in many disjointed directions. So aligning with your goals and getting advice from your employment team, like the ENs or the VR agencies, now that's going to be an important thing for you to do. To, to get feedback. Remember, we said there's three overarching things to do. Make a plan, take care of yourself, and ask for help. If you're not sure how to research companies and make a list of companies that align with your goals, and, and you qualify for the ticket program, I urge you to consider a relationship with a VR or an EN, and they could help you with that activity. And that would, of course, reduce stress by having them as your teammates there. Okay, we've covered the first five. We're gonna check out the second five, managing stress uh, steps two. Remember, these are gonna help you stay on track during the job search. And if we think if you practice this, these um, are best practices in, in reducing and managing stress. Um, so we, we covered the idea of um, you know dedicated workspace and research and these other areas but here I want you to make a list of potential contacts so that can be hard for some folks when we think about potential contacts if you're not familiar with a certain industry um, and when you're researching it if you don't know anyone that's in that sector then you you may stumble across some organizations so if I find that there's a mechanic, you know, shop that's in my area and that they have an, a website, I could create a spreadsheet of all the organizations for my non-office jobs that are in my area by company name, then by the title of somebody I find online and their name and their email address. So I create my own spreadsheet um, and I could also work with that employment team and they could help me develop a list of companies and potential contacts. But by having those potential contacts, you're going to be thinking about, okay, well, at some point I'm going to approach them once I'm ready. Um, and while you're doing all this research, you won't then say one day, wow, you know, I saw that mechanic shop online. I wish I had written it down. So staying organized and keeping a list of those contacts, when the time is right, then you're going to be able to um, get get in touch with those folks. Next, we have ways to re. Um, I'm sorry. Next, we have <laughs> number seven, applying for positions. Well, with after all this research, we got to get ready and apply. And we're if we're in the job search and we're not applying, then we don't really have the opportunity for success. So, done all the preparation, and now it's time to apply recommending setting aside a certain amount of time of each day. So you can apply during, you know, through different online platforms like LinkedIn or Indeed. And you can also do this directly on companies' websites. And of course, some employers, you can still apply in person with retail spaces and restaurants. The key is using your plan and your schedule to allocate time to apply. So I'm going to be dedicated today from 2 to 4 p.m. to go back to the potential contacts I had and send emails and tell them, you know, I've applied or I'd like to apply and then take notes about those and then you could circle back to them later. Next, track the jobs you apply for. As I mentioned, we're tracking these in a spreadsheet. We're able to follow up with them in order to 
ask, did you receive this? Send a follow-up message. Many people receive many emails, so you have to compete for their time. So staying organized and tracking those jobs that you're applying for and working with your employment team, giving them feedback, will help you stay organized and find more success out of those applications for interviews. Um, you know, this could include weekly and monthly goals. We've talked about daily and hourly, but when we think about job search, we could think about having weekly and monthly goals for the number of new contacts, the number of new companies, um, and the number of times that we're spend, uh, spending networking, asking people for advice and asking people for leads to employers that are hiring. Um, and when we do this, we're practicing things like our elevator pitch. We're improving our resume because we're asking for help. Um, and, you know, in some cases, you might get new experiences through things like community service. It's a great way to improve your skills, your asset inventory, um, and to give back to the community. Um, so that can maybe create new relationships for you that give opportunities for um, other places to apply. And number 10, of course, we recommend consulting with a member of the employment team. I've, member, uh, I've mentioned it throughout, but additional support's available. If you're a beneficiary, you can reach out to an employment network and receive additional support. It's important, remember, as we mentioned before, if you're working with the VR, that you work with the VR, and then 90 days after case closure, you can have your ticket um, over with an EN. So you have to wait until the VR services are done. But the option is here for you to work with an EN for additional support, and we really encourage you to bring them on. Okay, we've had 10 great tips here, and I hope you took a few ideas away. Maybe not all 10 of them are for you, but in some cases we hope you can find one or two that you would add in that will help manage some stress and put you in a better position for success in your journey um, to try and enjoy a little bit of the process as you search for this job, because when you find it, it's going to be really rewarding. So we have, once we acquire work, you know, we've gone through the job search process and now we've acquired work. There's some tips for reducing stress at work. Things like using a white noise machine, listening to soothing mu music, um, you know, looking at work as something that's going to get interrupted. So uh, like trying to be a little bit more flexible um, or, you know, trying to create uninterrupted work time. Um, you can use natural lighting to assist or dividing larger assignments into smaller tasks and goals is a good strategy as well. And we've been talking about that throughout with the job search process. To mention that, you know, if reducing stress at work, you can actually look up modifications like the ones I just mentioned as reasonable accommodations. And you could find these at ashjan.org or the Job Accommodation Network. And in particular, I looked at it this morning. You could go to their Disabilities A to Z database, and I put in mental health conditions, and there were some great tips on uh, managing stress at work. And it included some technology apps and some other ideas, and there's some articles, too, by their Human Factors consultants. So ashjan.org is a great organization to uh, gain some recommendations for. If you like, go in the web links pod. You'll find that at item number 10. Okay, to wrap up today, we have um, two success stories we wanted to share with you. Um, first, Hazel. Hazel, here we have two slides, but after experiencing sudden mood swings and difficulty in controlling her emotions, Hazel was diagnosed with multiple conditions, including borderline personality disorder, depression, generalized anxiety, substance use disorder, and alcohol use disorder. And Hazel ent entered a drug and alcohol treatment program and started receiving SSDI while focusing on her health. And then Hazel began volunteer work, but she had concerns about her disabilities and how they may interfere with work after her earnings and um, would put a stop to her SSDI and Medicare. She was worried that earnings would impact her ability um, her uh, kind of bigger picture. Well, here, here's 
Hazel Part 2, and there's a picture of Hazel smiling. It's important to think about this um, uh, Hazel story. Uh, you know, it's been eight years now since Hazel took those first tentative steps. She went into a, a kitchen as a volunteer, and she's since traded her SSDI benefit for a larger paycheck. She has overcome addiction, and she's learned how to manage her mental health, and she now helps others find their way as a mentor in this field. So she used her own lessons, and, you know, Hazel said, there are a few things more gratifying than helping someone else avoid the same traps that almost killed me. This job saved my life. Employment brought about a real turning point for me. It has been such a critical part of recovery. Make no mistake, recovery is something you give away every day. The work I do here allows me to share my recovery with those who need it most. So really pleased for sharing Hazel's story. If you want to view it, there's a link in the web links pod. And um, she is a great success story. We also have Jason. And let me bring up Jason as our second success story. Here's a picture of Jason. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder as a teen. And Jason looked for structure and productivity by working with a VR agency where he was then introduced to the ticket program. And Jason received through the VR program and then with the follow-on services from an EN, um, career counseling, education and training, help with resume writing, interviews, and job leads. And he had, through VR, an individualized plan for employment. So one of the keys to Jason's success, you know, Jason lives in Nebraska, and he contacted Nebraska VR, and they set up that plan. He went and acquired his associate's degree in human services. And so, you know, he went back to school, got that, and then after he came out, he liked the human services area so much, you know, next Jason decided to go after that for a field and he worked a, a, a job in, at Region 5 services helping adults with developmental disabilities integrate into the community. Jason was part of Partnership Plus, working with the VR and then the EN. Jason said, I feel like I'm paying things forward. I had a support system that helped me and I like providing support for others. I guess you never know what your dream job is until you find it, and I really found mine. Ticket to work worked for me. So that's Jason's success story. We appreciate him sharing that so we could share it with you today. Now, how to get mental health help? It's important if you want to get emotional support at any time of the day, you can call, text, or chat with trained counselors at the 988 Lifeline. You can call 988 Eight, eight to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Uh, this is sponsored by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. There is a link to SAMHSA information in the web links pod as well. I will also note that you can reach, for deaf and hard of hearing individuals, you can use the online chat feature, or for TTY users, you can dial 711 first then 988 and you'll be directly connected with somebody. They also have great tips around finding a therapist and building a support network and much more. Visit 988lifeline.org for more information. And at this point I'd love to bring Pat back in for our second question set. Pat? Well thanks Derek. Now I know I have to up my exercise and my nutrition. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it, that really uh, rang true for me. Thanks. Um, one of the questions we have, it, it's a little different from what you've gone over. It says, do I need to disclose my mental illness to my employer or my coworkers? Uh, thanks, Pat. This is Derek. Yeah, it's a really important question. Uh, the answer is uh, no. That choice is completely yours. Um, this is disclosure is a personal choice and never a requirement. There are some other factors that could come into play. If you're going to ask your employer for a reasonable accommodation, that maybe you want a flexible work schedule, well, then you would have to disclose. If you're applying for a position 
let's say with the federal government and you wanted to use um, what you know, they call the Schedule A uh, employment process, you would disclose. That way that you could be hired non-competitively. So there are some examples where you would disclose in order to access the benefits that follow, but please know it's a personal choice and disclosure is not a requirement. The choice is completely yours. If you want to keep it private, certainly do so. Thanks. I think that's something everybody needs to know, no matter what their disability. Uh, next question is, when I used to work, if I made a mistake, my anxiety would get really bad and I'd stress out about the mistake. Do you have any advice to help so that I'd stop focusing on negative things so that I can do better at work? Pat, this is Derek. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I've, I, a lot of us understand the person that asked this question. I think a lot of people can relate to it. I think the recommendation that I would make is the first off to recognize that we all make mistakes. Everyone makes them. And for the most part, everyone gets stressed out about it. The key is what tools do we have to handle that? And are we learning from, from each one so the next time we experience the mistake, we can reduce the amount of energy that we spend with the stress and we could get back to, you know, doing all the other things that we've done correctly. So I would I would recommend thinking about that. Um, think about some of the factors that led to the mistake as well. You know, you know, Pat was mentioning, you know, nutrition, and you know, we talked about sleep. You know, well, the day that you made the mistake, were there a lot of other things that contributed? You know, did I get the sleep that I need the night before? Um, did I put myself in uninterrupted workspace or did I not get the right amount of sleep and did I have interrupted time or was I multitasking? I personally find when I make most of my mistakes it's because I'm multitasking and even though that can be considered a strength for me it's probably a weakness and I need to reduce that. Um, I also think that we want to surround ourselves with employers and colleagues that understand that mistakes can happen. And so trying to have the confidence to ask for help would be another strategy. You know, supervisor, I, I recognize I made a mistake. These are the things I think contributed to it. Can we have a conversation so I could try to improve? If we can go through that tough conversation, then we have a better ability to communicate about stressful things and that itself will reduce the amount of stress you carry. So that's a great question, but remember, we all make mistakes. It's how we handle those situations. If we can learn from them, we're gonna reduce the impact and get back to doing the good things that we wanna be doing. Thank you, Derek. Uh this question is sort of, has got a practical aspect to it. It says, I've been feeling pretty good lately, but I've been here before, and then my mental illness gets worse. So it's kind of hypothetical. What happens if, if I no longer receive benefits because I'm earning work, I'm earning money from my work, but if I can't work anymore? It took me a long time to start receiving benefits, and I can't wait that long. This is Derek. Okay. I'm Pat, are you there? I am. Okay. Sorry. I just lost the screen. So I was just checking in with the team. Um, I'm back. Um, it, it's okay. So let me just re summarize that. I'm feeling good, but I've been here before and my mental health gets worse. What happens if I no longer get benefits? Um, you know, it took me a long time to get here and I can't wait that long again type scenario with the benefits. I think with this expedited reinstatement is what I want everyone to be aware of. Social Security has a work incentive. It's called expedited reinstatement and it's designed as the safety net. So many of you go through the job search and you start the job and, you know, you don't, if you try it, you're worried about well, what happens if I lose the job, then I can't go through that long process again. Expedited reinstatement is just that. It happens quickly. 
so you don't have to go through a long wait process that you went through when you applied the first time. So this is a work incentive. Remember, there's over 20 of them, and we talked about how the benefits counselors can assist once you're interviewing or once you start work. They can talk to you about that. But there is also, in the web links pod, um, a, a link to about the work incentives, and the expedited reinstatement would be in there. I'd encourage you to, when you think of all the risks, one of the risks is looking at the return to work process is um, it's so hard and I can't risk waiting in line I think again expedited reinstatement removes that risk so you could put that aside and go ahead and get get to try and work without the stress that the person asked. Thanks Derek. Unfortunately it looks like we're out of time for questions so I do want to thank you for providing this information about the ticket program and the team of service providers and for the suggestions about ways to handle stress. I know we've given you a lot of information. However, if you all take away anything from this webinar, I hope it will be that there are people that are ready and willing to help you, whether you're thinking about working, looking for work, or already working. Now, before we end the call, I do want to take a couple minutes just to share a little more information. If you want to start on your path or continue to expand your search, we have some ways to get in touch or to learn more. First, you can contact the Ticks to Work helpline. I believe Derek talked about that earlier. The helpline has highly trained specialists who can give you the kind of personalized information that we can't provide on a national webinar. Please call them at 1-866-968-7842, or you can call via TTY at 1-866-833-2967. And those lines are available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Second, you can visit the Ticket to Work website anytime. That's choosework.ssa.gov. You'll find more details on the website about the topics that we covered today. And you can also find us on social media or subscribe to our blog or email updates by visiting https colon forward slash forward slash choosework.ssa.gov forward slash contact. This link's also in the web links pod that we talked about under Ticket to Work contact information. You can choose how to connect with us. It's your choice. We encourage you to reach out in any of these ways to explore a little bit more about the program and how it can help you on your path to employment. In addition to social media and email, another way to get information about the ticket program is to opt in to receive our text messages. Just text TICKET, T-I-C-K-E-T, to 474747. Standard messaging rates may apply. You can opt out at any time. I'm guessing that many of you are using or would like to use the internet to look for jobs. We want to make sure you're aware of a program that can help you access the internet if you need financial help to do it. The program is called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it's sponsored by the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC. That program helps ensure that households can afford the broadband that they need for work or for school or for health care. It provides eligible households with a discount on broadband service and connected devices. It provides a discount of up to $30 per month towards the internet for eligible households and up to $75 per month for homes on qualifying tidal lands. To find out if you're eligible for the program and discover how to apply, go to FCC.gov forward slash ACP. Also, it's important to note that individuals who receive SSI are pre-qualified for eligibility. It's important to note that if you need to contact Social Security's Office of Employment Support, that's the office that manages the Ticket to Work program, please do it electronically instead of by postal mail. You can email us at support at choosework.ssa.gov. Just a reminder, please don't include any personally identifiable information. We'd like to have you join us for our next webinar, Reasonable Accommodations in the Path to Employment. That webinar will add to some of the information that Derek shared today. It will be on July 26th from 3 o'clock 
to 4.30 Eastern Time. Registration is now open at shoeswork.ssa.gov forward slash wise, or you can call the Ticket to Work helpline to register. Finally, help us plan future webinar topics and provide your feedback by taking our survey. A link will pop up after the webinar, or you can find the survey in the web links pod, or by visiting the Ticket Program website at choosework.ssa.gov forward slash surveys forward slash wise. I want to thank you for taking the time today to learn more about the program and the services and supports that are available to you. I hope we've given you information that you can use in your own situations. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.